Greetings and hello. I'm Colonel Frank Blazic. This presentation was first delivered at the 2019 Civil Air Patrol National Conference in Baltimore, Maryland. To increase accessibility, I have opted to narrate this version and post the presentation here on YouTube. The research and conclusions are all my own, drawn from work on this topic over many years. I hope you will find this presentation of interest. In the December 28, 1943 restricted report of the Civil Air Patrol to the Assistant Chief of Air Staff, Operations, Commitments, and Requirements, Civil Air Patrol's national headquarters included a detailed summary about the Coastal Patrol operation that ran from March 5, 1942 to August 31, 1943. Among the figures listed are two highlighting the military nature of these civilian flown missions, namely, a report of 82, quote, bombs dropped against enemy submarines, and, and the claim of two, quote, enemy submarines definitely damaged or destroyed. In February 1944, the United States Navy published the August 1943 War Diary for the Eastern Sea Frontier, which also included the cumulative CAP Coastal Patrol statistics. The Navy War Diary prefaced the information by noting that, quote, the CAP Coastal Patrol left an interesting record of service. Since the fall of 1943, CAP has believed that its 18 month long Coastal Patrol operation definitely damaged or destroyed two German U-boats. Following the conclusion of the war, this claim evolved within the organization to become a claim of destroying two enemy submarines, albeit with only circumstantial supporting evidence. CAP's wartime history is oftentimes ignored by scholars, although several dismiss CAP's claim to sinking submarines while also acknowledging the contribution CAP made to the overall success in the Battle of the Atlantic. Nevertheless, articles or press releases from CAP, the United States Air Force, or other accounts of CAP's Coastal Patrol effort repeat the claims of destroying submarines. The surviving CAP Coastal Patrol records have never before been subjected to academic scrutiny, but a reevaluation of the claim of damaging or destroying two enemy submarines is long overdue. Through the use of previously lost or unavailable primary source material, this article seeks to explain how privately owned civilian aircraft came to be armed and the actual results produced from this effort. The CAP Coastal Patrol effort commenced in March 1942 in response to the German submarine offensive off the east and later Gulf coasts. To supplement the efforts of the Navy's eastern sea frontier, together with the Army's Eastern Defense Command, the Army Air Forces initially established a 30-day experiment on February 28, 1942, to evaluate the feasibility of using light civilian aircraft to patrol the coastal shipping lanes. Flying from fields in Atlantic City, New Jersey and Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, the Army Air Forces ordered CAP personnel, quote, to establish an inshore anti-submarine patrol for the purpose of reporting the locations of enemy submarines and friendly vessels in distress. Typical patrols consisted of two ship formations with two man crews, pilot and observer, flying from dawn to dusk at altitudes ranging from a few hundred to perhaps a, few, a thousand feet above the waves for hours at a time up to 15 miles offshore. Aircraft were instructed not to approach closer than 1,500 yards to any surface vessel. Equipped with two-way radios, patrols would submit contact reports for any observed hostile submarines, vessels in distress, or unusual activities to military authorities. From the first flights, March 5, 1942, CAP Coastal Patrols proved useful to military officials. The unsophisticated CAP aircraft flying slow, low-level patrols over the ocean proved ideal for spotting small objects easily missed by high-speed military aircraft. CAP's aircraft provided an inexpensive and conveniently visible deterrent to U-boat surface operations. Aircraft in general posed the greatest threat to U-boats because of their speed, small size, and the vulnerability of the submarine pressure hulls to damage from bombs. U-boat doctrine entailed crash diving upon sighting an aircraft. 
which involved submerging as quickly as possible and fleeing the area in case of retaliation, thereby breaking off any potential attacks. The first CAP Coastal Patrols were almost entirely improvised affairs, trial and error. Aircraft assigned to Coastal Patrol duty had to be rated with 90 horsepower or greater engines, equipped for instrument flying, and feature a two-way radio phone transmitter. The aircraft themselves, all pre-war, commercially produced models, represented a mix of over 19 different manufacturers and a dozen engine types. Navigation depended on pencil and paper, although crews also relied on known navigational fixes, such as lightships, buoys, or shipwrecks. Instruction for air crews came internally, either from among task force personnel or from civilian aviation experts. The CAP task forces turned to the Army Air Forces for specialized anti-submarine warfare training, who admittedly had little for its own air crews. CAP received some training materials from 1st Air Support Command for familiarization with U-boat tactics to help improve spotting accuracy. Other training materials from the United States Navy were distributed to CAP Coastal Patrol personnel over the course of the year. The events leading to the arming of the CAP Coastal Patrol Force originate in May 1942, during a period of significant shifts in the Battle of the Atlantic for both CAP and the United States Navy. That month, the Navy's first escorted convoy sailed south from Hampton Roads, Virginia on May 14th, while a northbound escorted convoy sailed from Key West, Florida the following day. Convoys, demanded for months both in and outside the Navy, brought an almost immediate reduction in shipping losses along the eastern seaboard. With easy, unescorted targets no longer available on the east coast, German Vice Admiral Karl Dennitz, commander of submarines, shifted his U-boats operations southward along the Florida coasts, the Caribbean, and into the Gulf of Mexico, where aerial defenses were in short supply. In the first week of May, three U-boats, U-109, U-333, and U-564, plied the waters off Florida near Morrison Field, West Palm Beach, home to CAP's third task force. Between the three submarines, from May 1st through the 9th, six ships went to the bottom with another three merchantmen damaged. During this period, patrols from the third task force located survivors from the freighters Ocean Venus and Eclipse. Around dusk on, Mar on May 6th, a CAP aircraft reported sighting a U-boat just off Cape Canaveral, quote, in such shallow water that the U-boat rammed its prow into the mud bottom while attempting to escape. CAP First Lieutenants Thomas C. Manning as pilot and Marshal E. Doc Rinker as observer circled nearby for 20, 42 minutes and radioed for help, but none arrived until well after the submarine had vanished. Although the identity of the enemy submarine cannot be conclusively determined, this incident, coupled with the increased U-boat activity further south in the Palm Beach area, caused a stir in Washington. Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Ralph Bard, wrote to Vice Admiral Frederick J. Horn, Vice Chief of Naval Operations, and reported a phone call he received from, quote, a very responsible man, reporting the attacks off Palm Beach. He stated that no Navy ships assisted the survivors, while the Army bombers at Morrison Field had, quote, no bombs and no authority to do anything but reconnaissance. Lieutenant General Henry H. Hap Arnold, Chief of the Army Air Forces, passed Bard's letter to the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, General George C. Marshall, and mentioned his receiving of a report of a submarine seen, quote, in such shallow water that it required some 20 to 25 minutes to get clear. All this time, one of our small reconnaissance planes was yelling for help while it circled above. In reply, Major General Follett Bradley, commanding 1st Air Force, stated the destruction of submarines remained a Navy matter. Arnold decided to strike back. He telegraphed Bradley, ordering 1st Air Force, quote, to equip the Civil Air Patrol airplanes operating under the 1st Air Support Command with 100-pound bombs for use against submarines. Arnold next wrote Marshall, 
suggesting that all Army air units on anti-submarine activity be placed under the immediate control and authority of the commanding generals of the defense commands and to arm all small reconnaissance aircraft with 100-pound bombs. On May 11th, Brigadier General Lawrence S. Cooter, Deputy Chief of Staff, Army Air Forces, directed that all, quote, puddle jumpers on anti-submarine patrol, ergo CAP aircraft, be modified to carry and release 100-pound bombs. Five days later, 1st Ground Air Support Command included language in its letters of instructions for the 5th through 8th Task Forces that read, quote, Airplanes of the CAP units, when equipped with suitable racks, are authorized to carry and drop bombs. By late June, 1st Ground Air Support Command updated all the CAP Task Force mission statements for patrols to include the phrase, quote, to take all action within their means to destroy enemy, any enemy sighted. From May to July 1942, the Army Air Forces further expanded the CAP Coastal Patrol effort. Additional bases were activated in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, and North Carolina. In July, the War Department authorized all CAP members to wear military-style rank and regular Army uniforms with certain distinguishing features, particularly garish red shoulder loops. Then unbeknownst to the American forces, on July 19, 1942, Admiral Dönitz withdrew the last two U-boats off of Cape Hatteras and transferred operations to the mid-Atlantic. Post-war, the German admiral remarked that despite his shift in priority, quote, American waters were nevertheless still worthy of exploitation in any area in which the defensive system was found to still be defective. By late September of 42, CAP operated 21 coastal patrol bases, completing a network of inshore coastal air coverage for the entire eastern seaboard and Gulf Coast, with 423 mech aircraft operating from Maine to the Texas-Mexico border. The collective blanket of Army, Navy, and CAP air coverage as observed in a 1945 Army Air Forces study, quote, undoubtedly exercised a determining influence in the enemy's strategic withdrawal. Although it remained clear that the enemy was not defeated, but had, quote, merely concentrated his efforts in other areas. Arming the CAP Coastal Patrol posed a challenge for First Ground Air Support Command. By June of 1942, only 82 of 137 coastal patrol aircraft were equipped with bomb racks. To further alleviate the situation, on August 22nd, 1st Bomber Command under 1st Air Force took over general supervision, administration, training, and operations of the CAP coastal patrol bases and delegated administrative, training, and operational control for CAP to the 1st Patrol Force through the 59th and 65th observation groups. First Patrol Force would see to the complete arming of all CAP aircraft, as well as develop tactics and techniques for coastal patrol. On September 4th, First Patrol Force removed the 15-mile patrol limitation for the CAP coastal patrols, authorizing future operations to, quote, extend such distance offshore as the capabilities of personnel and equipment will permit. In due course, CAP aircraft began to venture upwards of 60 to 100 miles offshore for anti-submarine patrol, convoy escort duty in the shipping lanes, or special missions. Three days later, the patrol force issued a new mission statement for all CAP coastal patrol units, which read, to conduct a continuous patrol over coastal shipping lanes during all daylight hours for the purpose of protecting friendly shipping and or locating and reporting enemy submarines, enemy warships, or suspicious surface craft, and to take such action as equipment permits in destruction of enemy submarines, to conduct such special missions as are directed by this headquarters. As with the arming of the aircraft, the removal of patrol restrictions represented the military's growing confidence in the proficiency of the CAP personnel as well as their deterrent capability. On October 15, 1942, the War Department activated the Army Air Force's Anti-Submarine Command, or AFAC. All 21 CAP Coastal Patrol bases 
including then 365 aircraft and 1,663 personnel, subsequently fell under the operational control of AFAC. CAP's personnel continued to operate under previously issued policies and directives. By November, AFAC organized the 21 CAP bases under the command of either the 25th or 26th anti-submarine wings headquartered in New York and Miami, respectively, which coincided with the eastern and Gulf sea frontiers. CAP Coastal Patrol bases organized within the sea frontiers were assigned to the respective wing, and the commanding officer of the respective wing exercised operational control of the CAP bases. AFAC tasked CAP Coastal Patrol units with essentially the same mission statement as First Patrol Force. AFAC provided CAP with specific patrol and operational guidance far exceeding previous instructions. All Coastal Patrol bases would also maintain two aircraft with combat crews on alert during daylight hours on call for on-command missions. Patrols would now be limited to no more than 60 miles offshore. And by summer 1943, AFAC provided opportunities for CAT CAP Coastal Patrol personnel to receive formalized instruction in bombing and anti-submarine warfare techniques. But in fall 1942, the CAP Coastal Patrol armament situation proved disappointing. Since September 1939, the British had recognized that a 100-pound bomb, even with a direct hit, which was difficult with even the best of bomb sites, did not guarantee the sinking of a U-boat unless the pressure hull was breached. Furthermore, larger, torpex-filled aerial depth charges proved the ideal weapon. At the time of AFAC's establishment, less than half of CAP Coastal Patrol aircraft had bomb shackles installed capable of carrying AN-M30 100-pound general purpose demolition bombs, or in far smaller numbers, the AN-M57 250-pound demolition bomb, or the Navy's Mark 17 325-pound depth bomb. AFAC did report that a minimum charge of 30 pounds of TNT was, quote, smallest that with reasonable assurance will afflict lethal damage in direct contact. For larger ordnance, like the Mark 17, a bomb dropped within a 17 to 25 foot radius of a submarine's pressure hull would be lethal. Ergo, a small bomb's lethal radius equated to a contact hit, whereas a large bomb gave more variability for a kill. Bomb sites and training for bomb runs in turn would be required to increase the probability of accurate attacks. But less than half the CAP Coastal Patrol aircraft were equipped with simple bomb sites. Nonetheless, the primitive equipment or limited training did not deter CAP air crews from attacking when opportunity allowed, with 70 bombs expended in 51 attacks by October 14, 1942. But, as the Navy noted, safety considerations required CAP to drop 100-pound demolition bombs at appreciable altitudes, quote, which precludes any consistent accuracy. Even lightly armed, however, CAP aircraft could strike at the enemy, and in theory, could deliver a deadly blow. The majority of documented CAP Coastal Patrol submarine attacks date from May to November of 1942. Throughout this period, approximately 42 U-boats patrolled at varying points along the east and Gulf coasts, during which time CAP reported 39 attacks on enemy submarines. CAP's two incidents claiming to damage or destroy a submarine both occurred a day apart in July. The first incident occurred on July 10th, approximately 14 miles off Cape Canaveral at position 28.43 north, 80.30 west. Aircraft from the 5th Task Force, Daytona Beach, Florida, had only just begun armed patrols on July 1st, with racks and simple bomb sites installed by Army mechanics at nearby Orlando Army Air Base. All base aircraft carried the AN-M30 bomb, either as singles or as a pair. Details of the incident are fragmentary at best, but according to CAP and United States 10th Fleet records, a CAP Coastal Patrol aircraft dropped three bombs on a reported submerged submarine at 13-14 hours, albeit presumably from at least two aircraft. 
The incident is not mentioned in the 5th Task Force yearbook, but 10th Fleet gave the incident two record numbers, and the Joint Army-Navy Assessment Committee evaluated the results as H, for insufficient evidence of presence of submarine, and later J, for insufficient information to assess or inconclusive. That same July day, a Type 7C submarine, U-134, commanded by Captain Lieutenant Rudolf Schendel, was sitting on the ocean floor, 26 miles from Cape Canaveral, but he reported no attacks nor sounds of explosions in his war patrol diary. The second incident forming CAP's damaged or destroyed claim has more substantial supporting evidence. Coincidentally, it occurred the day after the incident off Florida. But unlike the 5th Task Force, the Atlantic City's planes sported an array of bomb racks installed at Mitchell Field to carry the smaller 100-pound demolition bombs, but also the more formidable AN-M57 or Mark 17 bombs. None of the base aircraft, however, had bomb sites. On July 11th, one of the morning patrol aircraft from the 1st Task Force reported spotting a U-boat cruising on the surface off the coast of Absecon, New Jersey. After the reporting patrol returned to base, a Grumman G-43 Widgeon seaplane, flown by CAP Major Wynant G. Farr and Captain John B. Hagen, flew to the reported position and began a search for the submarine. Locating a faint oil slick, the men tracked its origin and concluded that the submerged submarine was moving parallel to shore. After patrolling for several hours over the location of the target, the men reported the submarine rose to periscope depth at which point they dropped the Widgeon's two Mark 17 bombs, producing a spreading oil slick and bringing fragments of wood to the surface. Farr believed he saw the bow of the submarine break the surface of the water before sinking below. The Eastern Sea Frontier War Diary entry for July 11, 1942, reports CAP sighting a submerged submarine at 39.07 north, 74.13 west on course 280 degrees, which was later revised to 39.15 north, 74.13 west, with, quote, globs of oil appearing at distances of 15 feet and spreading. The entry notes that the latter position was three miles west of the wreck of the cargo ship San Jose, sunk after a collision on January 17th of 42. There is no mention of CAP attacking the object, but a Navy blimp, OS-2U Kingfisher aircraft, patrol boats, and several Coast Guard cutters depth charged other positions in the area, bringing up wood and oil on the same day. The U.S. 10th Fleet assigned the attack incident number 1083, occurring at 1545 hours, with a Joint Army-Navy Assessment Committee evaluation of J. As with the incident of July 10th, German war records show that a Type 7C submarine U-89 was patrolling slowly on a south-southwesterly course within 60 nautical miles of the shore. On the 11th, the boat's commander, Captain Lieutenant Dietrich Lohmann, did not report any aircraft sightings, much less attacks, in his war patrol diary, with the submarine approximately 53 miles from the reported position of the CAP attack. Two days later, U-89 was spotted and attacked by an aircraft approximately 50 miles east of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, with three bombs causing slight damage to the submarine. CAP did not report this attack, which German researcher Axel Niestel credits to a B-18 bomber of the Army Air Force's second bomb group. The reports of July 10th and 11th, 1942, from the 1st and 5th Task Forces arrived at CAP National Headquarters in short order for compilation with reports of the other task forces. Colonel Harry H. Blee, CAP's operations officer, oversaw the CAP Coastal Patrol effort during the war and received weekly reports from the task forces detailing total missions and hours flown, submarine sightings and or attacks, irregularities at sea, floating bodies, or mines. Blee, in turn, submitted a weekly report which tabulated these figures for CAP's national commander, Major Earl L. Johnson. In his report to Johnson of July 16, 1942, covering the period of July 9th through the 14th inclusive, 
Lee reported, quote, Civil Air Patrol planes dropped a total of seven bombs against enemy submarines. These bombing attacks resulted in the definite destruction of one submarine and the apparent damaging of another. This assessment of damage or destruction appears to originate from Lee's analysis of the daily S-3 operations reports from the 1st and 5th Task Forces, evidently independent from the assessments of 10th Fleet, confirmed post-war by the surviving records of the German U-boat force. A following report, issued months later by CAP National Headquarters on October 20th, 1942, details that from June 25th to July 29th, 1942, CAP Coastal Patrol aircraft, quote, definitely damaged two enemy craft. By April 1943, prior to CAP's transfer from the Office of Civilian Defense to the War Department, a report authored by Captain Kendall K. Hoyt CAP National Headquarters Intelligence Officer stated, quote, two enemy submarines have been destroyed or damaged by bombs from CAP planes. This claim of two submarines damaged or destroyed substantially subsequently, excuse me, found its way into the draft of the biennial report of the Army Air Forces. At the conclusion of the Coastal Patrol Service on August 31st, 1943, CAP tabulated its data in August and September of that year, the Bureau of Public Relations for the War Department received data on Coastal Patrol operations, quote, through channels, as reported by CAP National Headquarters. The War Department released this CAP information in a press statement about the Anti-Submarine Command on December 10, 1943, and CAP National Headquarters released its own version of this release, approved by the War Department's Bureau of Public Relations one week later. This official CAP statement of December 17, 1943, listed 173 submarines spotted, with 57 attacked with bombs or depth charges, and noted that CAP, quote, was officially credited with sinking or damaging at least two, in addition to those sunk by Army or Navy aircraft called for the kill by CAP. A restricted report of the Civil Air Patrol published weeks later on December 28, 1943, by the CAP National Headquarters for the Assistant Chief of Air Staff, Operations, Commitments, and Requirements, included a summary of CAP Coastal Patrol operations postdated 3 September 1943. This statistical summary reported 82, quote, bombs dropped against enemy submarines and listed two, quote, enemy submarines definitely damaged or destroyed. The only record or source that corroborates official credit appears to be Colonel Blee's July 1942 assessment of reports from the two CAP task forces. In March 1944, the Army Air Force's Air Inspector released his report of an investigation of the CAP from January to February 1944. Among the facts in the report, the document includes the September 1943 Coastal Patrol summary data, quote, reported by the Civil Air Patrol, further reproduced by the Navy in the February 1944 War Diary. The investigator wrote, quote, because of the conclusion of these operations, no detailed study of the accuracy of these claims was made. However, access was had to the evaluations given by the Navy to all claims of sinking submarines and it was determined therefrom, which is a typo, that in the case of four claims made by the Civil Air Patrol, one was evaluated, no damage, two, insufficient evidence of presence of submarine, and a fourth, insufficient evidence of damage. The armament carried by CAP planes during these operations was 100 pound demolition bombs. The question is presented as to how much damage a bomb of that weight and character could inflict upon a submarine under most favorable circumstances. The report raised clear doubts about the credibility of the CAP claims. On August 31, 1944, Johnson sent a reply detailing assorted corrections in response to the Air Inspector's report. Johnson does not mention, question, or rebuke the Inspector's statements regarding the Coastal Patrol summary data. In June 1945, when CAP National Headquarters submitted a historical report for the official history of the Office of Civilian Defense, the history noted CAP as, quote, 
officially credited with sinking or damaging at least two, for referencing enemy submarines, in addition to those destroyed by planes or ships summoned by CAP. After the fall of the Third Reich, the records of the Kriegsmarine, notably those of the U-boat arm, were captured by the Allied forces. Analyzed in conjunction with the Ultra Intercepts, which were decrypted German radio traffic, the Joint Army-Navy Assessment Committee was able to account for the fate of all of Germany's 1,154 U-boats. Of the 14 submarines confirmed sunk off the American Eastern and Gulf seaboards from March 1942 to August 1943, None were confirmed sunk by the CAP. Indeed, the committee did not assign CAP credit for any U-boats. The question of CAP damaging U-boats was not studied, but of those CAP attacked to receive 10th Fleet incident numbers, the most promising evaluation recorded is F, for insufficient evidence of damage. Furthermore, CAP has no viable claim with regard to the enemy submarines destroyed during its 18 months of patrol operations. Of the 14 submarines destroyed, American military forces, supported by physical or documentary evidence, receive credit for definitely destroying 11 of these. The Kriegsmarine never reported any submarine missing sent to American waters over the same period, and contemporary studies of all available data on the fate of all 1,154 U-boats corroborate the German record. From an examination of the existing archival evidence from Army, Navy, and German sources pertaining to CAP's Coast Patrol effort, several conclusions are reached. CAP aircraft neither destroyed nor damaged any enemy submarines from March 5, 1942 to August 31, 1943. The claim by CAP of damaging or destroying enemy submarines appears to originate from within CAP's own national headquarters, based on reports from the organization's Coast Patrol task forces. The United States military did not formally credit the CAP with the destruction or damage of two enemy submarines, either during or after the conclusion of World War II. But what is known today is that German U-boat war patrol diaries record how observing aircraft had an adverse effect on submarine operations. While not clearly indicating who the observed aircraft were, it is likely that some of these aircraft were CAP Coastal Patrol planes. So long as the war in Europe continued, the claim of two damaged or destroyed submarines, as published in the fall of 1943, was considered valid, or at least publicly acceptable. The CAP damage or destruction claims are now known to be without factual evidence. However, the CAP Coastal Patrol Service proved a viable component to the nation's overall anti-submarine defense plan. For 18 months, civilian volunteers flew privately owned civilian aircraft over the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico in defense of the United States, with a minimum of funding from the federal government, private industry, and often the wallets of the volunteers themselves. CAP's Coastal Patrol Service provided a stopgap measure when the nation's armed forces lacked the assets to deter and constrain enemy submarine operations. Although armed, destruction of submarines was never the primary duty of CAP Coastal Patrol. Rather, CAP coastal patrols were flown to inhibit enemy submarines from sinking merchant ship vessels and to deter attacks off the nation's coasts. Working in conjunction with the nation's armed forces, CAP ensured the safety of the nation's coastal waters in the critical period after entry into World War II. Statistically separating out CAP's distinctive contribution to defeating enemy operations from those of the armed forces has proven impractical. However, as part of a larger effort, CAP's contribution proved valuable enough to sustain for 18 months, as mentioned previously. This contribution thus is thus best measured not in destroyed submarines, but rather the untold numbers of men, ships, and war material that arrive safely on foreign shores to help defeat the Axis powers. I hope this presentation has been of some interest, and I welcome your comments below. Thank you.